Hello, good afternoon. Thank you so much for having me. It's an honor to be here. Uh, welcome those uh, watching virtually as well. Uh, my name is Mark Rotaco. I serve as Chief Government Affairs Officer for the National Association of Counties. It's an honor to be here. I want to thank all of you for joining us today and a special shout out to NACO members who flew in to join us today, Judge Barry Hyde and uh, Director of Public Works, Ramon Gavarate. Um, thank you again to the Bipartisan Policy Center uh, for having us and for the, strong for the strong partnership that you all have with the National Association of Counties. For those of you who may not know, counties are leaders in the nation's transportation and infrastructure systems where we steward the lion's share of roads, bridges, and directly support public transit systems and other airports and other transportation systems that keep our residents connected with one another, with vital services, and with other county institutions. As owners, operators, investors, and end users of infrastructure, county officials have long held streamlining the federal permitting process as a top priority. Through common sense reforms that remove unnecessary red tape and reduce delivery timelines for critical infrastructure projects, we believe that environmental review processes such as NEPA can be both streamlined and strengthened. New strides made in the bipartisan infrastructure law will help us further this progress, including through the permanent authorization of the Federal Permit Improvement Steering Council, better known as the Permitting Council, who we are so honored and delighted uh, to be joined, by us, joined with us today. As state and local governments look to invest significant sums of money through BIL's funding opportunities, we appreciate our federal partners like the Permitting Council and the Council on Environmental Quality, who are working to deliver some of the nation's largest and most intricate projects more efficiently. These projects have significant economic benefits that are felt locally, at the state level, and of course nationally. The Brent Spence Bridge that connects Boone County, Kentucky with Cincinnati, Ohio, and carries two major interstates across the Ohio River is a great example of the decades-long nationally mission critical project that stands to benefit greatly from the permitting council. And while the council focuses on complex infrastructure projects like the Brent Spence Bridge and countless others across the country that require multiple permits, multi-year funding agreements, and a ton of work on the ground, counties continue to urge Congress to make similar accommodations for those smaller, more, less environmentally significant projects that county officials carry out each and every day. Holistic reforms of federal environmental review processes for both large and small projects will allow state and local governments to maximize the historic investments provided by the bipartisan infrastructure law. We also appreciate the recent release of the White House's new permitting action plan and look forward to working with our intergovernmental partners to achieve badly needed progress on infrastructure. With that, again, we are so honored today to be joined by our keynote speaker, Christine Harada, who has been appointed by President Biden to serve as the Executive Director of the Permitting Council. As Executive Director, Ms. Harada manages a portfolio of nearly $100 billion of large-scale infrastructure projects, most of which are in renewable energy, coastal restoration, and electric electrical transmission. She leads 13 federal agencies, state agencies, and project sponsors to develop and implement project-specific timetables for all required infrastructure and permitting reviews and authorizations, working with the administration to rebuild the economy through infrastructure investments. Formerly the president of an impact investing company, Ms. Harada has served in various executive level roles in the private sector. Under President Obama, Ms. Harada served as the White House Federal Chief Sustainability Officer and as the Acting Chief of Staff and Associate Administrator of Government-Wide Policy and Acquisition and uh, at the U.S. GSA. Ms. Harada, Christine, thank you so much for joining us. And I'll so turn it over me. to you. Great, thank you. Uh, well, so firstly, thank you again, everybody, for, uh, for having me with you all today. I'm very honored and delighted to be with you. Special thanks to the Bipartisan Policy Center uh, for hosting this event. Um, we are the newest member of the federal family, and so I anticipate that many of you may not have ever heard of the Permitting Council uh, prior to the advertising of this particular event. Um, but my role is fundamentally to deliver on President Biden's infrastructure agenda. <clears throat> 
Bottom line, period, end of story. Uh, it's been great that with the passage of the bipartisan infrastructure law, there's been a ton of funding, well over $110 billion that have been um, you know, already distributed to the states and local governments um, just from the, the, the infrastructure bill itself, but also in addition to that, thousands more um, no foes uh, and notices of opportunities coming out in the near future as well. Funding is great, but permitting is where the proverbial rubber meets the road, and I think I don't need to lay heavy on this particular audience that you know this is exactly where we really need to work together and ensure that we are reducing the friction uh, with respect to getting this infrastructure actually done. <clears throat> you know, President Biden talks about the infrastructure decade, and you know, certainly we are absolutely kicking that off with the bipartisan infrastructure law, and I am here to make sure that we are working through that decade with you because we cannot do this without you. Um, you know, when it's done right, obviously infrastructure investments, and Mark, that was a fabulous phraseology as owner, operator, investors, and end users of the infrastructure. You all know very well uh, what it takes in order to be able to get those activities or get those projects um, invest, uh, not just permitted and, you know, getting it going in your communities, but also what it means and does for your communities, right? Like, you know, a lot of us will hear talk about economic development and, you know, very... <clears throat> what I would consider more policy wonky kind of terminology, which may be appropriate given where we are. Um, but fundamentally, it's about you know, connecting communities. How is your kid able to get to school? How is my teenage son able to exercise some independence um, you know, by being able to leverage a public transportation system? Uh, candidly, we live in, on a personal note, I live in Los Angeles County where you know, our driving age is 16 and very nervous about that, candidly. And my 13-year-old son is still chafing. Uh, you know, at the bit, because he really wants to exercise a little bit more independence. And so for cities like Washington, D.C., where we do have a transit center, uh, transportation authorities, I think it's fantastic. <clears throat> so I am likely going to throw a ton of information at you. Um, and so if you'd like, you know, please, for those of you folks who are in the room, please refer to the flyers that were on your chairs. And for the audiences um, that are virtual joining us, um, please refer to uh, some of the materials that were sent to you via email from the Bipartisan Policy Center. So, you know, to help address the challenges associated with permitting large infrastructure projects, um, Mark, you touched upon this in the very beginning, uh, that it needs to go through several processes. And NEPA is just but one of them. Uh, in order to be able to help address the challenges associated with coordinating all of that, uh, in 2015, uh, Congress passed the Fixing America Surface Transportation Act, or it's called the FAST Act, <clears throat> and under Title 41 uh, of that act established the uh, Federal Permitting Improvement Steering Council, or the Permitting Council for short. The Permitting Council consists of the 13 federal agencies that are involved in reviewing and authorizing infrastructure projects, and it also has members of the White House, specifically the Office of Management and Budget and the Council on Environmental Quality as well. Uh, the agency publishes a public-facing dashboard uh, that it provides an online tracking system of the projects that are in the permitting process as they're going through it. It's called the Federal Infrastructure Permitting Dashboard. Very straightforward. Uh, but to coordinate projects and to provide that transparency and accountability uh, for their progress. Um, the Permitting Council works to ensure that the environmental review and permitting of the major infrastructure projects is predictable, that it provides a forum for identifying and resolving challenges, uh, ensuring the transparency and accountability to the American people, and providing um, <clears throat> for efficient collaboration and coordination amongst the numerous agencies involved in the effort. And through the activities of the Permitting Council, uh, you know, we are definitely working towards ensuring that that it's not just talking points, that we are truly building that sustainable job creating infrastructure projects and the activities that really spur a lot of that kind of life in your respective communities. <clears throat> so the type of projects that we've got uh, under the Permitting Council, Mark touched upon this earlier, that you know, we have $100 billion within our portfolio. That is, I would like to say, just thus far. Um, we, uh, our work applies to large, complex infrastructure projects in 12 sectors. And the sectors include areas like conventional energy production, renewable energy production, broadband, transmission lines, pipelines, um, <clears throat> hydropower dams, etc. And so if you have a project, let's say, for example, you've got a project that you would like to build that out in your local communities, um, the integrated process and governance model is designed to ensure that they are the robust and complete environmental reviews and stakeholder engagement processes along the way and that we do it right. 
to help best support the best possible cultural, environmental, and uh, community outcomes for each of these projects. Um, additionally, the project must meet one of uh, four criteria, project criteria. There are kind of four categories of criteria, if you will. The most, uh, the first listed in the statute, and the most obvious one is what we call the objective criteria, i.e., especially those very large projects, those that are over $200 million that require NEPA uh, and does not qualify for any abbreviated authorization. So, for example, like an emergency authorization, uh, post disaster type of thing. Um, Different criteria also apply for carbon capture projects, as well as tribal sponsored projects, uh, which is a newer addition for us in the bipartisan infrastructure law. <clears throat> uh, if, uh, if a project does not meet any of these criteria, we can still cover it, if you will, under a transparency criteria, as well as by a majority vote of the permitting council if we think that it's in the interests of transparency. Um, WERDA funded and DOT funded uh, projects are excluded from FAST 41. They have their own separate processes. Um, and so basically FAST 41 covers all the infrastructure projects except for uh, roads, bridges, tunnels, trains, and transportation. <clears throat> so once a project's accepted into the process, you know, what does that process look like? Well, most importantly, first and foremost, the project receives a consolidated project plan. It is not earth shattering, but it contains all of the federal environmental reviews and authorizations that are required for that project. And I, contrary to popular belief, that does not and had not really happened uh, prior to the FAST 41 uh, statute being uh, authorized or being you know, enshrined in law, if you will. And so it actually requires a significant amount of both work and collaboration across the various federal agencies um, to be able to do that. <clears throat> The, uh, then, of course, the, the lead agency works to administer the timetable, and there's a whole variety of rules associated with milestone management, um, et cetera, that's articulated in our statute. It's weedsy details. States, for those of you, I recognize this is counties and cities, but for those of you who work closely with your state government officials, states can opt in to the FAST 41 process itself as well. And so that means that if a state says, hey, we would like to collaborate with you, we would set up an, an MOU with the lead agency on the federal agency side, the respective permitting agencies from your state side. If the counties and cities also want to join in on that, I'm 100% open to that idea. And that also those subjects you to the rules, the milestone management and the dashboard management rules that all the other federal agencies need to abide by. Basically, it's a solid project management type of stuff. <clears throat> um, a value add of the dashboard, you know, that I would like to highlight here is that in addition to the transparency of the permitting process is that you can also, it also discloses things like the contact information, some really basic things about the project itself. Where is the project? What does it do? Who's the primary point of contact that I need to talk to? If I have an angry community member or somebody who's like very frustrated by the process, would like to engage in the appropriate stakeholder engagement processes, et cetera, this is a website that you can go to that lists that kind of information. Um, and so you should be able to, you know, it's hopefully a one-stop portal for, for those <clears throat> types of interests. Um, I would like to also mention that despite the name FAST 41, it is not a shortcut. We do not, we do not cut corners. We don't do short shrift to any of the environmental reviews or authorizations or statutes, you know, the primary savings and times that we have been able to achieve this far largely has been just due to pure and simple coordination. It's not pure and simple. Just because it's simple doesn't mean it's easy, right? But it's simple coordination. Uh, and also having the ability to convene issue resolution um, meetings with the respective senior leaders at the federal agencies, right? Sometimes there's some really sticky policy issues, uh, you know, depending on maybe but this particular project butts up against a National Wildlife Refuge and it needs to cross the Mississippi. Those are some really sticky questions that you really want to make sure that the appropriate policy makers are in the room to be able to make the call. And that's one of the, uh, the benefits that we afford the project sponsors who participate in our program is that we have the ability to be able to do that. It's not like, okay, wait three months, no, wait, let's see, wait like six more months to see if we can get on your calendar type of thing. That is something that we are able to help convene. Um, <clears throat> and, you know, one thing that, um, <clears throat> another thing that I'd like to highlight, um, 
of some of the updates from the bipartisan infrastructure law is that a um, couple of things. Number one, we now have the authority under um, the bipartisan infrastructure law to transfer funds to federal, state, local, and tribal governments in support of these environmental reviews and authorizations activities. So for example, our, for our friends in cities and counties, that, um, that those fund transferabilities will be subject to your state rules, uh, but that is certainly an option now. Um, another uh, benefit is that we have a new type of covered project, a transparency project, such that if there is a project that is of interest for your local communities that you think would benefit from having that transparency, we have that option as well. It would not be subject to all the milestone management type of rules, but it is there. And so there, it's a great place for you guys to keep track, at the very least, keep track of the progress of what are all the activities going on. Um, and hopefully uh, make the opaque black box that the federal agencies can be a lot more transparent. <clears throat> and certainly, last but not least, one of my favorite updates is the addition of tribal nation projects, the eligibility for tribal nations Native Hawaiians and Alaska Native corporations, et cetera, uh, to be able to uh, participate in the process as well without the $200 million threshold. That was a previous big roadblock for them. And so when it came to projects like broadband, for example, that was also a bit of an obstacle that we'd found in the first iteration of the statute. And so that was something that was addressed uh, with the bipartisan infrastructure law. Um, with the, and Mark had touched on this earlier as well, but you know, with the permitting action plan, uh, that this administration has published in May. They're definitely doubling down on the permitting council as well and applying a lot of the principles um, across the entirety of the federal government. <clears throat> and the good news, I'm hoping that the good news for cities and counties is that, you know, in our experience, we have seen projects that have languished, for example, or taken a lot more time than they should have in the federal permitting process that once they join the Fast 41 process, all of a sudden, everything becomes more clear. You know who's on first, what's on second, what's the status of this, and things actually move uh, to make sure that those projects are finally permitted. Um, I'd like to close by saying that you know we are 100% aligned on this. We want to make sure that we are delivering on the infrastructure agenda, at the, certainly at the, at the administration level, but of course, working with you closely in collaboration with you. Uh, highly vested interest to make sure that we are doing this together for the next decade, and it's not just a, a one-time thing, right? Infrastructure is a forever thing. It's not like our phones that you recycle after every two years or so. These are 20, 30, 50, 100-year investments that we're making in our communities, and so we're in it with you. Thank you <clears throat> so much. That was just terrific. Thank you for being here. Uh, thank you all for being here, and also thank you to our, our, our co-hosts. NACO and NLC, um, this, this series that we've been hosting around the, the challenges and, and opportunities from uh, the IIJA, the Bipartisan Infrastructure Law, uh, has been, it's been a, a great series, um, mostly because it's a great law. Um, we are really excited about it. The, the chance to invest in the future of our country through infrastructure uh, is so important. And, you know, I think we're all excited about the, the economic benefits uh, I think we're excited about the quality of life benefits from building this new infrastructure. And a lot of us are excited about the environmental benefits and climate benefits from building this new infrastructure. But we don't get any of those benefits until we actually build the infrastructure. And that's where things have historically been difficult and why we're here today. And this, this concept of, of permitting is, uh, you know, in my mind, a process for how we figure out whether or not we're meeting our standards. And the thing I like to, you know, remind people of is that we don't have to change any of our standards. Having high standards is great. But a process, now that's, that's something you can improve. You can, you can make it more efficient. And, you know, that's why we're, we're so excited by what you're doing. Uh, at, at BPC last year, we, we put together a, a task force, our, our Smarter, Cleaner, Faster Infrastructure Task Force. A uh, great bipartisan group, um, and we came out with 23 specific permitting recommendations. Uh, many of them made it into the, the bipartisan infrastructure law. There's still, there's still more to do. Um, but one of the important ones that made it in was permanent reauthorization of the Permitting Council. And that's why we're here. Thank you. 
Thank you very much for that. It's well, actually made a really big difference. Well, thank you. Thank yeah. you. We're, we're, we're your biggest fans. I don't know if you knew that or not. Um, so, you know, historically, historically, I feel like people talked about permitting as, um, as, a, as a policy that was like in, in the category of like good government, like is government functioning well? Um, and some talked about it in the category of, you know, something that business needs. It's a, it's a business request to, to improve permitting. But more and more, people are actually talking about improving permitting with a, a climate lens, mm -hmm. that we need to build decarbonizing infrastructure in time to hit net zero by 2050. And the talk is ticking. The clock is ticking. Clock is talking? I don't know. Um, <laughs> So, you know, can you, can you talk about how, how you're viewing that, that climate lens and how it animates the work that you're doing? Oh, 100%. Um, <clears throat> 110%, actually. Uh, if I had a table, I'd be pounding the table <laughs> on that one. Uh, so, yes, I would say, actually, there's a number of imperatives that I think, again, thanks very much to the work and the support that the Bipartisan Policy Center has provided uh, for the Permitting Council that I think really all sorts of things come into play. So climate change, for sure, and the fact that we need a lot of these solutions, um, you know, to help address the existential crisis that is <clears throat> the climate crisis. But also, relatedly, a lot of the technologies that are needed to be able to help support that cleaner energy transition are still newer, newer. It's not new. It's not like R&D type of stuff. It's out there, and, and we've heard and read a lot of stuff in the media about, you know, like, yes, it's available and we can do it, that type of thing. We just need the will. <clears throat> it is still new work. And so there are still things out there that are a little bit unknown mm -hmm. to us in terms of how we want to think about it. And so, you know, one of the, one of the value adds that I'm certainly hopeful and certainly work for the permitting council to provide is in addressing uh, a lot of those kinds of uncertainties and questions, if you will. So, for example, um, the operational side of things, you know, making sure that there's clarity with the permitting timetable, that type, type of stuff, is all well and good. But again, with something like offshore wind, for example, as we think through an actual project, it, it's, it's one thing to think about it in the abstract, and then when you actually see a project, you're like, okay, here are the specific permits that we would need to go through that. Here's the specific fact patterns. Okay, great. So here are both the operational challenges. Who do I need to talk to over at Forest Service, at National Parks? at, you know, BOEM, the Bureau of Ocean Energy Management. Um, who do I need to engage with there on the permitting side of things? Fine. But then there's some real big policy questions, right? So, for example, on the Atlantic seaboard, uh, tremendous issue right now with the North American right whale. Uh, and what kind of implication, what implication does it have for the species' ability to survive if we are pounding and driving thousands of wind turbines? Mm -hmm. So we got to think through that. What are the more creative solutions that we could be implementing in order to be able to help mitigate a lot of those effects? Um, and also, you know, then that's just for the newer fields, right? Also for perhaps a slightly more traditional, like utility scale solar or solar fields, especially out in the Southwest, you know, the technology is also evolving such that now we have bifacial solar, right? And so that changes the solar field size. It's also changing the way that they do construction of the sites, as opposed to whereas previously it was like all completely um, <clears throat> uh, leveling the field, et cetera, and making it barren. Now, you know, we're actually mowing the desert, as if you can mow the desert. You can, but basically, you know, maintaining shrubbery to about 18 inches high so that it provides an ability for the wildlife in the area to be able to still thrive, both, you know, flora and fauna, while being able to provide the, the renewable energy needs um, that power <clears throat> both the West and the Midwest. And so in those particular cases, like being able to, again, call the operations into question and be like, hey, so you guys are stuck on this. Like, what's going on there? Is it a manpower issue? Is it a other resourcing issue? Or is it a policy question? So being able to help unstick that is a big role that we play. Great. So, you know, you know, hearing you talk about offshore wind, for instance, you know, it's, it's, it's impossible not to just think of the, the immensity of, of the challenge. You know, there are dozens of agencies and actors all with a little piece or a big piece of the puzzle that all has to fit together to make it all work in the end. And, you know, that's what makes it hard. It's, it's a communication challenge and, 
sometimes there's disputes and sometimes there's differences of opinions and there's ways to resolve it. And, and as you think historically, you know, different administrations, you know, going back to Nixon, have been thinking about how to, how to do this better. Mm -hmm. Democrats and Republicans. So how are we going to actually do it better now? I mean, obviously one answer is the permanent council. Oh, but, yes. But, <clears throat> what, you know, what's, what's, what's new now with this imperative, with your existence, with the bipartisan infrastructure law? How are we going to actually get it done? I do think that, again, the confluence of those three things, number one, the political will as articulated or as ex exemplified in the bipartisan infrastructure law combined with the funding, again, also exemplified in bipartisan infrastructure law and other sources of funding like ARPA funding, for example, et cetera. And certainly, last but not least, the codification, the permanent reauthorization of this governance mechanism. I, I think it's, it's like the, the three-legged stool that helps to support all of that effort. And I think one of the things that many folks, and I anticipate you know, the folks in this room, because of your, your roles, are likely much more sophisticated. But I, I don't know, for example, the average American probably does not know <clears throat> that for big events like the Super Bowl, that there are 22 federal agencies involved in that event. Federal. That doesn't include state and local. Right? 22 federal agencies. And the average person had no idea. Same thing with an infrastructure project. It's just the federal government. You know, but they don't understand that there are at least, for offshore wind, at least six agencies issuing 12 reviews and permits. And that's just prior to getting to construction. Post-construction, there's enforcement by the uh, BSEE um, and other compliance you know, mechanisms, for example, like a BLM. So, I don't think the average person really seeks to, uh, is able to understand that. And I guess maybe that's like one um, request or pitch for, for cities and counties is to help us with articulating some of the complexity around that. Who are all the different entities that need to, you know, that do need to chime in and help out with this, recognizing that, um, that there is a risk of, oh my goodness, it's just far too much bureaucracy kind of messaging risk as well. But the reality is that's what actually needs to happen. Um, in addition to that, of course, you know, collaborating with state and locals, the tribal nations, and ensuring that they are, that all of the government entities and the communities are brought in earlier uh, in the process. <clears throat> Great. So you guys have been around for a handful of years now. Mm -hmm. um, you know, not, not quite long enough for you guys to be a, you know, historical mainstay of the infrastructure world, but long enough to have taken several projects through the process. Can you share any success stories, things that have gone really well, or, or things that you guys have learned along the way? Sure, absolutely. Um, we would like to claim success for the Gemini Solar uh, Project. That was one of the projects that I had alluded to earlier um, that had been in the federal permitting process for 10 years, I think, before they finally came to us. It's a utility-scale solar project out in the desert in, South, in <clears throat> Arizona. Bureau of Land Management Project is the lead agency there. Uh, they entered the project and we got that thing done within two years, well within two years, because things finally started moving. I think it was a very eye-opening experience for both the project sponsor as well as the federal agencies that were all involved with it, because with the requirement of actually composing the consolidated project plan, we're like, oh, we still have, we, we still have these activities that we still need to do. It was a very eye-opening experience, but then that also now allowed us to develop out that plan, manage the plan, work the plan, and actually get it done. Um, <clears throat> other patterns or other projects, uh, the South Fork Wind Farm Project off the coast of Long Island, New York, um, we've successfully permitted that particular project uh, in January of this year. Uh, that's the second wind farm that we have permitted uh, in this administration, and I would like to think that you know, seeing the evidence of these offshore wind permits actually moving, vineyard move, South Fork is moving, we have 10 more in the pipeline right now, is what contri is contributing to uh, the significant auction prices that we're seeing for a lot of these wind lease areas. That I, it is a strong signal, I would like to think, to the investor community, to the project developer community, to the state and local government communities, we are serious and we're getting this done. Right. So we talk a lot about projects. We could talk a, a little bit about people. At the end of the day, it's a bunch of people who have to get together and coordinate and make these decisions, review projects, review plans. And you know, I, I know that when the infrastructure law passed, we were hearing about the thousands of people that 
DOE would need to hire mm -hmm. or transportation would need to hire. What about you guys? Are, are you staffed up? Do you have the people you need? What are you seeing at other agencies in terms of like, do they have the staffing uh, levels required to actually efficiently move through this permitting process? Yeah, staffing is definitely, you know, I, I have a saying that I think my staff are very much, you know, like here she goes again type of thing, but ours is a government of, by, and for the people. Can't do good government without good people. End of story, right? And so, uh, it is with that kind of lens that I certainly pursued staffing up my team. And again, with the permanent reauthorization, we have been able to secure amazing talent, for which I'm grateful. I, I don't underestimate the, um, uh, the lack of a permanent job from <laughs> attracting good talent. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. It was a tough, but the moment, the, literally, the moment we were permanently authorized, resumes started coming in. People started reaching out, wanted to talk to us. It's an amazing opportunity, et cetera, et cetera. So our team, very fortunately, is staffed up. We are also in the process of, uh, as I alluded to earlier, in with respect to being able to provide funding, you know, transfer authority uh, and assistance to our federal agencies, sister, uh, sister agencies. We are in the process right now standing up also a blanket order agreement or basically a contract vehicle uh, so that federal agencies can deploy resources as they need for the respective projects. Um, <clears throat> and that is, uh, we're doing that in conjunction with the good acquisition nerds at GSA um, that are already, you know, they're vetted by, certainly by GSA, they are vetted uh, from a professional qualification perspective and so making sure that we've got that in place. But still that said, still a lot of opportunity for staffing out there in the federal government. I don't know if you all saw Secretary Granholm's, I thought it was an amazing video. Uh, starring Robert Darney Jr. about the Clean Energy Corps. Um, and so plenty of opportunities, not that I'm trying to steal folks from cities and counties. <laughs> uh, but I anticipate cities and counties are also likely going to face that kind of a need as well because they very much have a huge role in the overall permitting process. And that's still a, an ongoing challenge, very much an ongoing hot topic. Um, the bigger difference is that now we've got a lot more data and a lot more focus coming from the White House and the Permitting Council with the respect to the agencies, that's no longer just a hand-waving exercise. Oh, but we don't have the resources. Well, let's be much more specific now. Here's a list of projects that are coming down the pipeline. Mm -hmm. Lead agencies frequently will have, you know, some visibility into that, but a lot of the cooperating agencies don't until they receive that outreach for an endangered species consultation. Like, oh, what, what is this project? Where did it come from? And oh my goodness, now I have to rejuggle you know, all my workload type of thing. So being able to provide that kind of visibility for cooperating agencies, being able to provide funding to help those cooperating agencies, it's something that we're already doing right now, again, in support of Offshore Wind, um, so that they can help push those activities forward. You mentioned you know, with permanent authorization, recruiting became easier for you. you know, I, I remember hearing before the permanent reauthorization, before the infrastructure bill, as the Property Council was, you know, coming close to its sunset, um, that, that projects were reluctant to start the process um, because they didn't want it to, you know, evaporate in the middle. It, now that you've, you're permanently authorized, are, are you seeing an uptake in projects? And, you know, you know one, of, one of my fears is that you guys are one of the, the best kept secrets in the, in the infrastructure world and that not enough projects know about you yet and there's so many more should be taking advantage of what you offering. So where, where are you seeing in terms of uptake from the, from the project level? Yes, we're definitely seeing an increase in the number of projects, both inquiries as well as actual projects on the dashboard since I've come on board. I think we've added four new big projects, offshore wind projects to the dashboard. I take it back. And there's um, <clears throat> and one transmission line, the Sunzia transmission line is a new addition since I came on board as well as post bipartisan infrastructure law passage in November. So very explicitly tied to that. Um, we have also seen, uh, just in the past four months, upwards of 13 applications have come in, and we are engaged in, it seems like constantly, uh, but a number of projects, and from a whole variety of different sectors now, too, which is exciting for me. I'm a former aerospace engineer. I'm very much a nerd, but we're starting to hear from, like, hydrogen hubs, carbon capture, and so just thinking through the different kinds of permits, and the, that's my fun, puzzle solving. I'm a nerd. But, you know, having those kinds of projects to be able to think through, uh, definitely. Uh, figuring out the permitting for these hubs is something that we are definitely very focused on. Uh, we'd love to 
continue that conversation. Fantastic, let's do it. Um, so you mentioned this earlier, um, mm -hmm. the, the, the Biden administration put out a, a permitting action plan. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, I'm, I'm gonna quote a, a section from it here. It says that the administration will convene sector-specific teams of mm -hmm. experts that will also play a role in facilitating interagency coordination on siting, permitting, supply chain, and related issues. That's the end of the quote. Uh, for sectors like offshore wind, broadband, critical infrastructure, and transmission. Can you, can you talk a little bit about how this action plan is going to interact with the permitting council? And um, if I remember correctly, they had, they had a 60-day timeline mm -hmm. to come back with some plans, which is around now-ish. Um, so what are you what are you expecting to, to see here? A few weeks ish. Yes. Yeah. Um, yeah. So yes, we are working very closely with our uh, the the those cross agency working groups um, and trying to develop and ensure that the charters and the plans that they're developing for the permitting portion of it is very much tailored and fit for purpose for those particular sectors. Oh, but this is what's so fun about this job. There's so many different um, opportunities and challenges associated with each of the sectors. And what's also interesting further is that when we do our own intergovernmental engagement, there is a lot of just the diversity of the agencies that we need to do that engagement with on the policy level. So as you all are engaging with the federal agencies or the state agencies with respect to the policy side and thinking through, so if I'm gonna be developing out the offshore wind supply chain in the Gulf of Mexico states, for example, what would that look like? Permit agencies are frequently very different, right? There may be one or two agencies that overlap, but frequently it's also like zero. And so thinking through on a much more granular level what that permitting activity actually needs to look like, what are the things that we need to take into consideration? Again, it's when we get into the specifics, the devil really is in the details. We gotta think through what the individual fact patterns for both the projects as well as those particular sectors are gonna look like. Right. Um, so we're getting close to the end of time, which is upsetting to me personally because I have many more questions. Um, but the one I'd like to focus on right now, just to make sure we absolutely get this question answered, particularly because we've got our partnership with NACO and NLC for this series, is that interaction between the federal government, states, and local government. You, you mentioned before uh, the possibility of a, of a memorandum of understanding. Could you could you talk about what that opportunity is, and you know, what what do we need to do to educate states and local governments about that opportunity, and how we can use it to make sure that everyone is aligned on what the plan is, what the path is to actually efficiently get through the process. Yes, absolutely. Um, and we actually have we have two live examples uh, with the um, ecosystem restoration projects taking place in Louisiana. It's the Mid Breton and Mid Barataria sediment diversion projects. Uh, they're funded by Deepwater Horizon funding, <clears throat> but fundamentally it's about restoring land uh, that is currently being lost to the sea. It's truly frightening, in my personal opinion. Uh, those two projects alone are worth $6 billion. Uh, and while the project price tag, don't get me wrong, certainly not chump change, the impact to the state and what it means to the communities there is much more than just $6 billion. And so there we are entered into an MOU agreement with the with the state of Louisiana, specifically the CPRA, the Coastal Protection and Restoration Authority, um, and they are the co-project sponsor for those particular projects. And so we have articulated out in there that we will, yes, abide by the rules of the Fast 41 process, that we will manage the milestones, we will work collaboratively together. And it's not just words on paper, right? We have monthly meetings with the teams, we convene all the parties, at least on a monthly basis, make sure that everybody's collaborating. Mid Barataria, their end date is coming in September, so two months time. So we're at that real final managing, let's make sure that we got all the I's dotted and the T's crossed type of stage. Um, but in terms of you know working with the state government there, be super helpful um, for, for NACO and, and the National League of Cities to interact with your state agencies. Number one, inform them that this opportunity is out there, but also number two, frequently, um, a lot of these kinds of discussions come from the governor's office just simply because a lot of the authority is there and they can say, at least in the state of California where I live, it's like Cal Natural Resources, Coastal Commission, you all need to work together with GoBiz to get it all permitted, that type of thing. And so we have engaged in a number of conversations with a number of states um, 
for in particular for uh, some sectors, like for example, broadband, there's a lot of broadband funding uh, going out right now. And so how do we want to think about collaborating with both state government as well as with the Department of Transportation and non-highway use, if that's how you want to leverage the right of way or if there's other rights of way that you want to leverage within the state to make sure that we're getting it all permitted. Terrific. I'm going to try to sneak in one final question. Okay. So, you know, we've got a lot in the infrastructure bill that's helping you do your job. But my suspicion is that there's more policies that would help. What, what, what policies would you be looking at to help enable your work? More categorical exclusions, more programmatic review? What's, you know, what's on the menu of you know, your, your wish list if you, could, if you could wish new laws into existence? I am going to go with the unsexy but vital, which is back to an earlier question you raised around resourcing. Mm. Permitting for as much, uh, we hear about the complaints about the bureaucracy, et cetera, et cetera. We still do not see enough appropriations you know, provided for, especially the cooperating agencies. Mm -hmm. And I think it's also, again, let back to the whole lack of transparency around like lead agencies know what projects are coming down the pike, but cooperating agencies frequently don't. And so they're the ones that are frequently caught by surprise. Um, if I could put in a plug in for can we leverage some of the funding that we raise from the wind area lease auctions, uh, those go to Treasury, mm -hmm. solely to Treasury, which is fine, pays down the deficit, all that good stuff. Could we not allocate just even a small percentage of that to permitting? Because we are, we are providing these lease auctions specifically for project developer opportunity, for investment in our infrastructure. <coughs> Can we not? save off a little bit of it so that we can help execute it and make it a reality. That would be amazing. Resources are, are important. Well, thank you so much. This was terrific. I am going to, before the program ends, I want to thank you, and then I'm going to turn it over to uh, Irma for closing remarks. I, but th thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much for the work you're doing. You know, it's so important for our country. It's so important for our economy. It's so important for our citizens. It's so important for the climate. Um, so we're, we're just thrilled at the, the progress you're making and would love to continue working with you to, to do even more. Thank you so much. Oh, nice. Thank you. And now I'd like to invite on stage Irma Esperanza Diggs from the National League of Cities for a few closing remarks. Thank you so much. Thank you very much for that insightful um, discussion. Um, there's so much opportunity and there's so much need to navigate and make sense so we can create this puzzle. And frankly, um, the infrastructure projects that we are all invested, state, local um, governments in doing, there's so much at stake, we have to get it right. And these are long-term investments. I want to thank the Bipartisan Policy Center for hosting this discussion today, for inviting NACO and National League of Cities to be part of it. My name is Irma Esparza Diggs. I'm the Senior Executive and Director for Federal Advocacy for the National League of Cities. Thank you so much, Christine, and your engineering mind for being part of this discussion and really helping to provide some clarity to the process and what we as local governments can do to make sure that we understand this process and we get it right. And frankly, we know who to go to to help navigate because you are so many of the points you made were dead on. Um, we all know as local leaders that investing in our nation's infrastructure is an investment worth making and we have to given where we are today. It's going to drive economic recovery uh, in a sustainable way and improve the quality of life for residents of every neighborhood and getting people connected, getting people back to work. Um, we have all been calling for a serious investment in our in nation's infrastructure for nearly a decade, over a decade, really. And um, now, we as local leaders, we are ready to rebuild and we've already gotten to work and put this nation's historic investment in infrastructure and transportation, water, broadband, energy, um, put those investments to use in our respective communities. Um, 
at the National League of Cities, we hear from city leaders every day about how meaningful and impactful this investment is in, uh, in their respective communities and the difference it's going to make for their residents um, on everything from strengthening broadband to help bridge the digital divide and create greater equities there to rebuilding crumbling roads and bridges to help get people to and from work and making our infrastructure more sustainable and more resilient given the face that we, we will deal with stronger and more extreme weather events. We know that one of the keys is to make sure that every community can maximize this opportunity, and that's through improved interagency communication, coordination, transparency, early and meaningful engagement with local leaders and stakeholders. So I can't say it again. Thank you so much to the Bipartisan Policy Center for facilitating this conversation. As um, cities, towns, and villages, they and counties, we are all um, already are in the process of breaking ground on these projects. And we are pleased to have a federal partner committed to this endeavor in the permitting council. So Christine, whatever we can do to be a resource of assistance to facilitate communications, we are here and we stand ready. Um, by strengthening and accelerating federal permitting and environmental reviews and fully leveraging existing permitting authorities, um, as well as ensuring that all of these federal environmental reviews and permitting process are effective, efficient, and transparent. All of that will go a long way to make this process, this complicated process, easier to navigate. Um, we know that you are here to help improve these federal processes and that will help to make our nation, help our nation to make the most of this historic investment. Um, and really get money to where it matters in a way that it could be maximized as well for every community coast to coast. Again, you, Christine, you made the point about how important this is to just making sense of it all by connecting communities, right? And giving people opportunities and um, putting together this puzzle, this maze and the interagency coordination. And it's something that sounds so simple, but the reality is if you don't speak the speak, it is very complicated. So we are pleased to have you as a partner and we thank you for this important discussion today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much.